Howdy, Team 42. It's your skipper here, Darius Dell, to present another exciting episode of our Pro to Pro Live. I'm joined with our friend Gordon Johnson, founder and CEO of GLJ Research. How are you doing today, Gordon? Good, Darius. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure to have you on the show, man. You are a fan favorite and a fan favorite of mine uh, personally as well. Uh, few people. I don't know about that. No, I, I mean it, man. I, I genuinely mean this. Few people have such a detailed understanding of what matters, what actually matters in macro in so much that they have the such a same uh, detailed understanding of what actually matters at the company level. Uh, I think you're one of the better uh, stock pickers and certainly one of the best uh, stock presenters when you pitch an idea uh, that I've ever been around in my career. So I just want to say thanks uh, for all your education in that regard. Uh, but for, for those who may be new to us, and uh, you obviously repeat uh, a guest on the show, for those who may be new to you and what you do at GLJ Research, give us a little bit of background on who you are and what you guys are accomplishing for your clients over there. Yeah, thanks. So yeah, GLJ Research, uh, we pride ourselves on doing deep value analysis, which in this market, uh, one could question if ha it has any value. That's a joke. Uh, but so we like to find ideas, stock specific ideas where we can have a, I would say, macro backdrop. And what I mean by that is not not stock market, you know, broader economy macro, but specific to the sector. For instance, we like to have you know sectors where we can have a supply demand model and have a strong basis from which, you know, if a stock's up 20% in a day and you're saying short, or if it's down 20% in a day and you're saying long, you can still rest on your, um, uh, your base that, you know, you're going to be okay. Um, so, you know, we like to do deep dives on the supply demand work, and then we get specific into the fundamentals of companies. I think we're a throwback two years ago where we read 10 K's and Q's and understand what's going on uh, specific to the companies. Um, and, you know, we write research reports and make recommendations. And right now, people pigeonhole us into being short sellers. We're not. Right now, the bulk of our ratings, however, are sales. So, um, you know, we make our money when we're right and, and we don't when we're wrong. And so, you know, it, it's not a, a bias. It's not emotional. We're just trying to be right because uh, that's how we put food on our table. 100%, man. You put a lot of food on a lot of people's tables throughout your career, man. So just again, thanks again for joining us. So let's start with your broader macro views. Obviously, uh, you have a, a lot of interesting thoughts. You and I uh, spend a lot of time uh, emailing and messaging each other on Twitter about things like liquidity, what's happening in China. What's top of mind for you in the macro space? Yes, yeah, so let's start with the U.S. And this may this may surprise you, but I, I feel like, and this may be in line with your views, or at least but I think your views may be, be, be we think the market is going to be biased to the upside uh, near term. Uh, and when we say near term, we mean through the end of the first quarter. And let me explain. So um, we believe that one of the most important factors to look at, it's not a magic elixir. Clearly, there's a lot of factors. Um, but we believe one of the most important factors to look at is what we define as U.S. liquidity. And that's taking the Fed's balance sheet minus the change in the Treasury General account balance minus the change in the reverse repo account. And effectively, what that gives you is basically private money in a commercial banking system. Um, and if you look at that metric and you go back to 2009 and you track it versus the S&P 500, it's 89.3% R squared correlation. So not a perfect correlation, but clearly statistically significant. And if you know where that liquidity metric is going in general, you'll have a good idea of where the stock market is going. So that said, what are we looking at over the next, you know, roughly, you know, one and a half months? So Janet Yellen has told you that in one queue, she's going to issue about $400 uh, billion uh, of T-bills. Um, and we believe the bulk of those T-bills are going to be financed via the reverse repo account. And with the reverse repo account, and, and forgive me, your viewers probably know this, you know this stuff just as good, if not better than me, Darius. But uh, with the reverse, I'm just going to explain it real quick. What the reverse repo is, is in our view, it's, it's, it's excess money that was printed during the quantitative easing phase of 2020 to 2022, that was effectively sitting dormant. It's money that effectively was given to banks and, and other entities that went into this account that the Fed was paying you a rate on. Thus, it wasn't money that was finding its way into the real economy. Um, then when the death ceiling was lifted, right, and the Treasury general account balance, that's, that's one of the other factors, had fallen nearly to zero, and Janet Yellen needed to issue a bunch of uh, debt, right? Typically, that's funded out of bank reserves, but because you had this, you know, two point two trillion dollars or whatever it was at the time, uh, basically reserve of QE money in the reverse repo, um, she shifted from right. Historically, when the Treasury funds the government, historically they do 
15 percent um uh, t-bills or, or short-term paper right they never do 50 percent and, and jenny ellen did 57 percent in q4 and, and roughly q1 not not exact but the point is she shifted massively to t-bills so she did that intentionally in our view to shift the drain to rrp and that drain in rrp is effectively liquidity flowing into private hands it's not direct it's rrp buys yellen's bonds Yellen issued bonds and then she and then she that gives her money and then she uses that money to pay it into the private sector so that's where the money's actually flowing in so the point is as that rrp drops further in one q of this year we believe you're going to have continued liquidity flows into u.s markets and when we've seen that historically, irregardless of what fundamentals are, irregardless of what you know, inflation is, you, know, you may have a one day move, et cetera. When you've had these strong liquidity flows, stocks go up. So even though people pigeonhole us out of the bear, we've been telling our clients near term, stocks are gonna go higher because of this RRP drain, um, you know, all else held equal. However, so that's one Q, looking to two Q. Janet Yellen via the most recent QRA said she's going to actually allow roughly 245 billion of T-bills to mature. So there's going to be a net negative issuance. What that means is that our RP drain is going to stop. So barring, barring the Fed coming in and announcing another emergency lending program, which is effectively QE, we think you're going to have stocks go up Q1 and then in Q2, it's, it's like a roller coaster here, hill down, barring the Fed coming in um, and doing something. And against that entire backdrop i'm sorry guys real quick is that no, back, no, take the time. Backdrop. we've been saying for weeks that the cpi was going to come in hot now there's i clearly I, i'm not i'm not clairvoyant i didn't know if it was going to come in hot this month next month but here's the point there is you know this better than anybody uh, by the way darius i've learned a lot from you i just want to let your viewers know this guy is amazing um you know this right financial conditions have eased massively right since the you know jenny ellen the q the, the, the october 31st qra and then I want to talk about what Powell did, but you know, financial conditions have eased, and, uh, eased massively. So you now have financial conditions looser right now than they were pre when the Fed started hard, hiking rates in March of 2022, right? Mm -hmm. So, so th the point is, you know, with financial conditions loose, stocks near all time highs going up every day, people can't explain it, <clears throat> right? Uh, keep in mind, right? ahead of the december 13th fed meeting right december 1st Powell came out and said we're not going to cut rates in fact we're thinking about hiking rates right that's what he said two weeks ahead of the fed meeting right mm -hmm. the december 13th meeting now they kept rates flat december 13th but they did a complete pivot right when the december 13th came came around they were talking about rate cuts right oh, yeah. whereas before they were talking about we're not even thinking about cutting rates and we might hike rates in 2024 so that oh. was a pivot so you have you have this um, uh, massive um, loosening in liquidity, right? You have stocks at all-time highs, which is putting money into rich people's pockets. We now know that 10 the wealthiest 10% own 93% of stocks. So when yep. stocks go up, it's not benefiting. Uh, I consider myself a poor. It's not benefiting me. It's benefiting <laughs> people like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, right? Yep. And then you have a Fed pivot. You add all those three things up, and you're going to have a resurgence in inflation because it's things, these exact things, the world inflation higher the first time. Against that entire backdrop, you have the Fed coming out and saying financial conditions are tight. We're living in the twilight zone. It's crazy what's going on. It is crazy that normal people aren't pissed off, excuse my French, in the streets, mad that prices are going up because this isn't organic. This is being engineered by the Fed and Janet Yellen, and it's benefiting the, the, the wealthiest people in America, and, and you and me are paying for it by you know going to the store and paying 40 percent more for groceries every year it's crazy it's nuts so my point is i knew inflation was going to revert higher <clears throat> if you track inflation now versus 1960 to 70 it's going to revert a lot higher at some point this year um so this isn't surprising so my point is, so so anyways I'll, I'll stop there no no um, this is loaded and i love it this uh, you you your passion for this comes out every time you and I connect. I can see it on Twitter. I can see it in your research, man. I just want to say thank you for bringing it every day with that intensity. So you said a lot of things. Uh, I think the most important thing you said there uh, was that the liquidity functions and features in asset markets are likely to remain favorable, uh, at least through the end of Q1. They'll probably start to change right. a bit uh, in Q2. 
uh, Colin, if you throw this chart up on the screen, we just throw a couple of charts on, on, on to, to unpack kind of what Gordon is saying uh, from our latest macro scouting report. Uh, so, Gordon, you're, you're spot on in terms of uh, the net T-bill issuance that uh, they're targeting for uh, here in Q1 at $442 billion. Uh, they've been persistently uh, jamming the market with T-bill issuance. If you look at it through Q1, it's been 69% of total net marketable borrowing uh, in the trailing 12 months through Q1. That's, that number is going to go down because next quarter we're going to see a, uh, an outright decline of a $245 billion on a net basis in T-bill issuance. And that, in our opinion, is going to stop the RP drain, which has been this very favorable, you know, uh, you know, created very favorable liquidity or contributed to uh, very favorable U.S. liquidity conditions really since the early part of 2023. That'll stop that RRP drain at some point. Um, we expect there's at least another three to four, uh, four and a billion dollars to go between now uh, and then. Um, you know, one thing I would say is, uh, you know, I would argue that the T-bill issuance, which is, in my opinion, smart uh, fiscal policy in terms of recognizing that there's this excess uh, of demand for short duration instruments uh, in the financial sector. So why not go out there uh, and target T-bill and, um, and dump a bunch of T-bills on the market from a supply perspective, rather than dumping a bunch of coupons and bonds on the market? Why would you create uh, financial instability uh, if the inflation is actually uh, behaving? But to your point earlier, inflation, at least in the terms of the CPI statistics, uh, is no longer behaving. Uh, just a couple of stats I'll throw, it out, I'll throw out there before I give it, uh, you the floor back. Uh, we got uh, CPI yesterday, obviously. Uh, it was very hot, uh, particularly when you uh, an an analyze it on an annualized or sequential uh, basis. Uh, if you look at super core CPI, uh, which is core services X housing, uh, we accelerated to 6.5% three-month annualized. That number is more than twice uh, the pre-COVID trend. It's almost three times the pre-COVID trend. And oh, by the way, the year over year is actually starting to bottom and re-accelerate. Uh, at 4.4%, which is obviously uh, inconsistent with 2% uh, uh, inflation. Uh, and you go back and you look at uh, median uh, CPI or trim mean CPI, uh, those numbers are now at, you know, 4.1 and, and sorry, uh, they accelerated to 5.2 uh, 5. 5. and 4.1% 4. Uh, respectively. I mean, these numbers are obviously incredibly inconsistent with, you know, 2% inflation. So uh, there's been a big divergence in the uh, CPI statistics relative to the PC deflator statistics, and that's because of compositional reasons. But ultimately, some of the, uh, the, the the dynamics in the economy that are contributing to faster CPI inflation are likely to find their way into PC deflator statistics on the lag. Our expectation around that has been uh, sometime in the second half of the year, most likely in Q3, when we'll start to see that really cause problems for asset markets. Please. Yeah, that, that's a great. Uh, can, can I can I can I comment yeah, on that? Absolutely. Yeah, so that, that's a great overview. So, but Darius, I want your listeners to think about something, right? So, so, so I think the real problem with inflation is all this statistical noise, right? Yep. And my point is there's a profound disconnect. I'm reading from my notes here yep. from current available statistical measures and, you know, all these debates about core and super core and core goods, et cetera. And with the common man, let's say 80, 90% of the population or the layman is forced to buy month in and month out. You know, the disconnect is this, right? There's, you know, the disconnect is between the very broad official indices, CPI, course, whatever, whatever you want to call it, and the much smaller, what I'll call survival basket, right? Mm -hmm. um, of things that, you know, people have to buy every day. I think the disconnect between those things is why Biden's rating um, is abysmal uh, when all the intelligista are busy yeah. debating the path to two percent, and, and, and let, let me let me say, th talk about what I mean. Like, there are items that we can't live without, right? Yeah. Like stupid stuff. That's fun. I'm joking, but like food, shelter, insurance, and utilities, right? You look at yesterday's print, right? Shelter up sixty bips month over month. Yeah. Right? That's seven point two percent annualized. Auto insurance running at over twenty percent annualized. Food up forty basis points month over month. The point is. The layman doesn't recognize the totally fabricated inflation rates being posted by the U.S. government because they're not they're getting shafted much, much harder. Right. When looking at the basket of things they have to buy versus this uh, CPI number of three percent, you well, know, um, well, so don't forget, there's a loss of real. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Darius. Well, well, don't forget we're an election year here as well. I mean, think about I've been doing this for 15 years, you, you know, almost 20 years on, on Global Wall Street. And. I had never heard the phrase super core CPI until, you know, yeah. 18 months ago. <laughs> what is what the hell is core services 
X housing. You're talking about getting rid of food, getting rid of energy, and getting rid of housing. Well, if I don't have those things, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to do well at being a human being. Uh, so that is, right. what it is um, but you know, could it carry on? You'll be in the super grave. <laughs> I mean, yeah, exactly. It's, just, it's yeah. just crazy, man. It's just crazy. I mean, you know, I, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, the, the problem is instead of teaching, you know, the fundamentals of finance in elementary, they're teaching us, you know, uh, you know, advanced geometry and like people just don't know this stuff. Like you have to have an interest in it. Um, and you have to have a really, really a desire to know it because if you look at TV, right, Biden comes out and says it's all shrinkflation, you know, and, and, and his policies that are driving all this stuff, he he blames it on greedy corporations. That's like blaming a plane crashing on gravity. I mean, it's just it's yeah. it's nuts. Um, so the real issue here is out, you know, what, what the Fed will say is it's out of control government spending. But, you know, as well as I do, Darius, that the Fed is the only entity that can legally create us dollars so the government cannot spend without the fed basically printing money to buy yellen's bonds so the government can spend 100%. basically jenny yellen is the government's bank account and the fed is buying jenny yellen's bonds to allow her to refill that bank account to continue spending so if the fed were to say we're not printing anymore all these planned this this massive deficit spending would stop and i want to give one example remember Liz trust right in the uk Oh, yeah. Right. She had all these grandiose plans uh -huh. to spend all this money. Right. And what happened was her central bank was like, we're not going to issue. We're not going to subsidize your bonds. So what happened? She takes her plans to the market. Literally in one week, the bond vigilantes was just that's just a fancy way of saying bond investors were like, we're not buying all these bonds. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden rates shot up and her plans were squashed. She was kicked out of office and somebody came in who was more fiscally responsible, theoretically. So there's a solution to this. The solution is for the Fed to stop subsidizing uh, Janet Yellen's bond issuance. And so this is 100% the fault of the Fed. Clearly Janet Yellen's responsible. Clearly her and Powell are inter intertwined and they're all political. We're not looking at independent agencies, but there is a way for this to end. Um, and, and it's scary what could happen if it doesn't end. Uh, because, you know, cool. a resurgence in inflation could be catastrophic. You know, I'm talking about civil unrest um, and potentially worse in the U.S. We're, we're, we're headed for that long term. Uh, I say that with a high degree of conviction, having performed the deep dive empirical analysis to understand what actually happens to the economy uh, in a fourth turning. Um, you know, you know, uh, owed to my uh, former colleague, Neil Howe, uh, who's uh, who's authored this sort of um, with this late colleague, Bill Strauss, uh, this uh, generational concept of, uh, you know, these big changes in the uh, U.S. and, and Anglo-Saxon uh, political history. Uh, but one of those things that I think is missing from his work is a real deep dive study on what actually happens to the economy and to asset markets and the policy during these four turnings from a, from an investor standpoint. Uh, Colin, if you can throw the slide on the page where we show uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, one of the key takeaways of our four turning analysis, about 50, page, 50 slides of, of deep dive research. Um, you know, one of the things we determined is that headline CPI tends to be relatively strong i.e. on a median man max min basis in a quartile range basis in a four turning and it tends to spike as well. And so, you know, to me, in my opinion, I think this is something that we are certainly headed for, which is a more uh, inflationary outcome relative to what we've experienced in the past, you know, 30, 40 years uh, as investors and as people in society. Uh, we also know uh, that the, the budget deficit uh, tends to spike pretty materially uh, in a fourth turning. We see gut sovereign debt tends to spike pretty materially in a fourth turning. So in our opinion, the, the the things you're lamenting about with respect to the Fed, in our opinion, it's going to get worse before it gets better. The Fed is likely to get called upon to uh, sort of monetize debt and deficits at a, an increasing rate over the next, let's call it a decade or so, because that's as long as Neil thinks this remaining this four turning has to go. It's going to get worse before it gets better in that regard. And one final statistic I throw out at you, you know, we kept hearing supply chain disruptions and this and that, all these different reasons uh, for uh, for why we are deal still dealing with this sort of elevated rate uh, rates of inflation. A uh, figure statistic, which we now know is complete BS. But I, I'm sorry. Well, I would argue the average man and woman and Joe on the street uh, may or may not know it's BS unless they're watching Fox News. If they're watching MSNBC or CNN, they're probably still thinking it's pandemic related. But the reality is, if you go back and you look at the change in our in our sovereign debt from the end of 2019 to the end of 2021. So Trump and Biden, it was about three trillion in each year, six trillion total, and the Federal Reserve monetized 52% of that. 
that's about as inflationary as the U.S. policy has ever been outside of World War II. And so in our opinion, right. uh, you know, we're still dealing with the, the the sort of ghost of that. And we're not dealing with the ghost of that currently because we're still experiencing immaculate disinflation where it actually matters from a market participant's perspective in the PC deflator statistics. But it's our view that we're going to bottom, uh, at least that's historically, uh, at least according to our analysis, we're very likely to bottom at a level that is inconsistent with 2% inflation. And it's going to cause a whole host of problems for asset markets later this year. So, um, you know, kind of wrapping up the, the macro discussion, you know, it seems like you, you're expecting be better liquidity. You're expecting uh, that to... to negative uh, liquidity conditions. Uh, what are your thoughts broadly on the global? I know you spend a lot of time on China because it, it, it affects uh, your company, a lot of the companies that you follow. Yeah, so uh, real brief on China, I can do this very simply, uh, very quickly actually. So there's there's a viewpoint that you know China is gonna stimulate, right? That's been a viewpoint for at least 12 to 18 months. And we've always said they can't stimulate. And what we mean by that is, you know, there's already significant monies leaving China, right? Uh, money is leaving China because asset prices are deflating um, and the government is getting even more um, authoritarian, if you will. Mm -hmm. So the amount of bad debt that's been created and the amount of money that they would need to issue to have a dent on anything, right, is in the like four to five USD trillion range. And if they were to do that, it would absolutely tank the currency and the hot money flows would accelerate exponentially. Oh, so. Yeah. The problem is there's just too much bad debt. Um, and, you know, the government can't stimulate because it would basically wreck uh, the entire economy even worse. Um, so this idea that somehow China is going to come in and stimulate, and make everything OK, is just ridiculous if you look at the numbers. So, you know, China built a bunch of houses that nobody wanted. And that drove their economic engine for years. It lasted a lot longer than me and many thought it could, but it's all come crashing down now. Um, and they're going to have to go through years of pain, right? Remember in Japan, it was a lost decade, right? Yeah. People are assuming this kind of thing is going to be fixed overnight. It's not. No. So I think things continue to uh, disappoint and remain uh, quite mundane. What does that mean more broadly? Uh, China makes a lot of the commodities that the world consumes. Um, and if demand there suffers, which clearly it is, they're going to start exporting that deflation, if you will, to the rest of the world. Um, so it'll be bad for companies' margins. It'll be bad for you know, you know non-Chinese companies. Um, and, and deflation is a very ugly thing. Um, so I think that given the world's second largest economy is in a state of disarray, you know, stock market's basically saying it means absolutely nothing when all of these tech companies you know, have massive exposure to China. I think that the the Chinese dragon, if you will, has yet to come out to play uh, in a negative way. So I think people are missing that. And again, this idea that they can just stimulate their way out of this is uh, living in fantasy land, if you will, in our view. Yeah, no, you are very much uh, spot on uh, with a lot of our views on China. Uh, we, we slightly differ in the sense that, that they are, we are observing them stimulating, but we've long thought that their stimulus will be ineffective. And, and part of the reason for that uh, is that they're in a structural liquidity trap, much like what we saw uh, in Japan from the you know the early 90s onward. Um, and what we mean right. by that is that the incremental unit of credit growth is no longer capitalizing grow economic growth. It's just rolling over you know existing obligations and helping to capitalize uh, the refinancing of existing obligations. And China is firmly trapped in that scenario right now. We saw it with the uh, January credit data. Uh, it's, it's about as obvious that they're in a structural liquidity trap as I've seen in terms of the Chinese data. And they're not shy about uh, really uh, reporting it at this point, because I don't think uh, I don't think they're fooling. I think they recognize uh, just by looking at their own stock market and its inability to have a sustained update for more than a couple of days for the past two years. I think they realize that the Western invest, the wool has been pulled from over the eyes of Western investors. Uh, you mentioned something, uh, Colin, if you go to the slide on the screen, something that we very much agree with uh, in terms of their uh, inability to really, you know, kind of step on the gas pedal without creating a significant disinflationary impulse across the world. Uh, and this is something we've been calling out. We actually uh, did a presentation on this back in 2015 uh, when we noticed this divergence occurring. Uh, and we, what we saw is that the PBOC's balance sheet, which is the red line in the chart, uh, has historically been primarily driven, the growth of that balance sheet has been primarily driven by China's foreign exchange reserves because China has a clo largely closed capital account. So 
when you know China company sells something abroad, uh, that that those dollars come home, they get converted to renminbi, uh, and then they wind up in the Chinese banking se sector uh, as renminbi, uh, as, as as you know, sort of are really liabilities on the PBOC's uh, balance sheet. Well, that kind of all stopped uh, in 2015 once the yuan got on a real basis, on a rear basis, real effective exchange rate uh, as strong as it had ever had been. And um, part of the reason for that is because it, was, it had this loose managed peg to the U.S. dollar, which obviously bottomed in 2011 and broke out uh, in 2013 and really rallied sharply in 2014 and 2015. So that 2015, 2014-15 uh, break rally in the dollar, which dragged the yuan even higher to its all-time highs on a rear basis, really put, was the death nail for the China Inc. for the invest for the you know the investment boom that China was uh, creating on the other side of all those uh, current account flows. Again, those current account flows became liabilities of the banking sector. The banking sector turned around and levered that up and turned it into assets in the form of a property bubble, in the form of overcapacity on China's manufacturing sector. And obviously, as you can see, China's foreign exchange reserves have been, you know, flat and dead for, for quite a while. And ever since ever since then, any time the PBOC tries to uh, raise its, uh, you know, increase its balance sheet, you know, with via vis-a-vis -vis some other program, uh, large scale asset purchases, bank lending, uh, you know, sort of those kinds of programs, you've seen persistent capital outflows uh, in China. And those consistent capital outflows have really weighed on the Chinese yuan, uh, particularly since, you know, the beginning of 2022. And so it's our opinion that a lot of the incremental policy tinkering that the PBOC has done, lowering the triple R, lowering the loan prime rates, um, you know, increasing pledge supplemental lending, all these sort of things, increasing medium term financing, all these things that they're doing on their balance sheet, you know, to create uh, uh, what they think will be positive outcomes uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the Chinese economy, they're really not going to create positive outcomes in the ter terms of the Chinese economy. But what they are doing is creating positive outcomes from the perspective of global liquidity. And if you 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 view or listening to one thing, liquidity is fungible across borders. So whenever an economy is certainly as large as the second largest economy in the world is stepping on the liquidity spigot. Uh, you're going to see a positive impulse uh, in terms of uh, in terms of global liquidity, which is another uh, uh, a factor that's been contributing uh, to, uh, to 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 the positive uh, the Goldilocks market regime that we've been in uh, that our models have uh, appropriately called for uh, since November. So uh, we definitely wanted to uh, make the hammer that point home. So Absolutely. let's talk. Uh, let's talk some stocks, man. I love when you pitch stocks. Yeah. So um, I, I guess you know I don't know. Do you want to talk? Tesla, do you want me to pitch another one? What, what? How do you want me to do this? No, what's your highest conviction idea right now, man? I'm leaving the floor to you. Yeah, so let me let me pitch two. So, look, I, I know people. Are, <laughs> I hate to do this because it's always Tesla with me. People people <laughs> associate me with Tesla. We covered you know 21 stocks. I worked two night two all nighters all week. You know, uh, <laughs> doing a ton of work on stuff that's not Tesla. But I'm I, all I do is cover Tesla in many people's eyes. All right, so <laughs> listen. I, I was on the phone with the client this morning at 2 a.m. He's in London. Uh, and I was just up last night doing some work. And I told him, this is the year to short Tesla. And he's like, you know, he responds. With, I, I text him that. He responds with the one word response. I didn't know if he was, he's, he's in San Fran in London. He's in London. So he's up. He's like, why? And I'm like, okay, this guy's up. And I'm like, trust me, man. You know when I get conviction on something. He, he's been a client of mine since like 2008. And... This guy is one of the best investors. This guy is one of the best investors I've ever seen in my life. Like the guy is phenomenal. But you know, he's like he doesn't. He's like when you publish a note, if you want me to read it, just make sure you tell me to read it, and I will. Anyways, the point is this: he called me, and, and here's what I told him. Um, I said, "Look, the reason why you want to short Tesla now, and the reason why even if the market goes up in Q1, which we think it is, you still want to be short Tesla, is because the jig is up." And let me explain. So. EVs have been around since 1910, right? EVs were EVs were initially going to be the the technology that you know drove the mass adoption of cars. In short, why they didn't is because when that battery runs out, the cost to replace it is exponential. For instance, if Tesla battery dies today, right? The cost to replace that battery is twenty to thirty thousand dollars. You're you're effectively the car is totaled if your battery's out, right? And those batteries last maybe five to 10 years um, by, by many estimates. So, but that's not the point. The, the bigger point is it's, it's, it's currently it's loss making to make EVs, right? You, you've seen uh, Ford, Toyota, VW, Mercedes, BMW, um, Stellantis. 
et cetera, et cetera. And then the battery, the battery manufacturers, LG, CATL, Panasonic, all of them have scaled back hundreds of billions of dollars of planned investments in EVs this year and late last year. They all said, we're going to, we're playing that factory in, in, in the U.S. where the government was going to literally pay for half of it. We're not doing that anymore, right? Significant scaleback. Why? Because making EVs is loss making. So you'll say, but Gordon, Tesla is making a, a lot of money. Let me explain. And this is the crux of why now is the time to short Tesla in our view. So when COVID hit, right, and, and just real quick, so what drove that? What drove that was you had a part shortage. There was a part shortage, right? You, people said you don't have the semiconductor chips, you know, the, the auto chips, and et cetera. Historically, when a car manufacturer qualifies in a new chip into their car, an auto-grade chip, it takes two years to qualify that in. Why? Because you have to test it in real world environments and you have to do it like twice or some people even do it three times. So three seasons, three years. The reason why they do that is because if you put a chip out there that's defective, right? And you sell millions of cars and then you have to recall every single one of those cars and do a physical replacement, that could bankrupt your company, right? So that's why used cars were selling for more than new cars because effectively the automakers didn't have any new cars and people wanted cars, right? What did Tesla do? Tesla was qualifying chips in in two weeks, two weeks. In addition to that, they took chips out of their cars. They removed parking sensors. They removed fog lights. They removed chips from the steering wheel without telling their clients. I don't know if you saw, but NHTSA recently did a huge recall on their steering wheels having problems. You know, maybe it's associated with this. So Tesla did things that other automakers weren't willing to do, sacrificing significant problems in the future to have cars available in the present. So what happened? Tesla jacked up the prices of its cars. Its operating margins went from 5% to 19%. And Elon Musk sold that off as him being the most efficient manufacturer of automotives. Everybody said their factories are amazing, you know, this guy's a genius, you know. He, he said, I know manufacturing better than anybody, and everybody brought it hook on and sink. No, really what happened is he made his cars far less safe to have availability of cars, jacked up the prices. Fast forward to today, right? Everybody has cars available now, right? So what happened to Tesla's margins? They went from 5% in 2018 operating margins to 20% in 1Q22, and now they're back down to 8% and falling further because they're still cutting prices. So my point is, Tesla never had a manufacturing advantage. They never had a, uh, you know, a technological advantage. It was literally them willing to do things other automakers are not willing to do to have availability of cars. And now that everybody has availability, what are Tesla's run rate margins? Like, where are they going to buy them at? We don't know because they're still cutting prices, but it's somewhere below 8%. I would argue their net income margins are likely negative when everything bottoms out. So you have that. That that will become clear here. As they report earnings going forward, it will become clear that their earnings power is far less, far less than what people are modeling. That's number one. Number two, right? They're talking about you know building all these new factories. If you look at their fourth quarter uh, presser, they're saying they have capacity right now to produce over roughly 570,000 cars. It's over that amount. We don't know how much over. They say over. We don't know, right? They sold 484 in Q4. So they didn't even sell out their current capacity. And it's looking like this quarter, it's going to be something along the lines of like 470 to 450 to 470. So it's going to be even less. They can't even sell out their existing capacity despite massive price cuts, inventory discounting, et cetera, right? That's number two. So automotive manufacturing, you call up any CEO of an automotive company. They'll pick up the phone, ask them, where does your capacity utilization have to be at to be profitable? They'll tell you between 95 and 100 percent. Tesla is at like 80 percent, right? So then you look at their inventory situation. Uh, people track the inventory list on their websites. It's skyrocketing. It's currently exploding higher in the U.S., um, uh, Europe, et cetera. That's why they just cut prices. $1,000 on the Model Y in the US. So this is a company who, by the way, and, and with, with respect to their revenues, 94.4% of their revenues from selling cars 
in Q4, 93.3% in Q3. So for people who say this isn't a car company, that's just a ludicrous statement. It's the quintessential car company. Yeah. So this is a guy in a company. Well, what do they currently say it is, it is a the next, it, It's what a car do, company. It's, it's what, a, no, but what, what's, it, the, what's the other side of the view? What do they say it is if it isn't a car company? What, is, what, is the, what are the bulls arguing that it is? So, so Morgan Stanley, Adam Jonas at Morgan Stanley currently gives them like, like three hundred and seventy-five billion dollars of value for businesses they're not in. Let me repeat that: Adam Jonas at Morgan Stanley currently includes in his valuation three hundred and seventy-five billion dollars of value for businesses they're not in. Darius, why, why can't I pick up coverage of Nike? And say they're going to do, I don't know, computers and <laughs> double the value because eventually they're going to be. In this is, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not going to curse. This is freaking ludicrous that he's doing this. And that's what everyone else is doing. You know, Elon Musk, I'm going to Mars. Oh, that's worth $50 billion. Literally, uh, that's what these analysts are doing. It is, it is, it is analytical uh, uh, malpractice. It is, it is, it is sell side malpractice with these analysts are doing and it's it's because look, the reason i get upset darius is because there's going to be some 80 year old woman you know sitting at her house in uh you know uh akron ohio who watches cnbc and sees adam jonas come on and tell her this stock that's trading at 184 dollars is going to 500 and she's going to take half her net wealth and put it in there based on this analysis he's doing that's why i get angry it's not because I have any bone to pick. It's because this is ridiculous. This is not how this is done, as you know. Oh. So, but let's get back to the point, the, the fundamentals. The point is their fundamentals are imploding, right? There's not going to be another part shortage. So their operating margins are going to continue falling and they're going to continue struggling. And against that entire backdrop, the auto industry writ large is telling you people don't want to buy EVs. So we're pulling the 100 billion we were going to invest where the U.S. government was literally going to give us half, right? This is happening across the board. People just don't want EVs. Like we've said all along, they don't make sense for the masses. Do they make sense for a guy who makes $2 million a year and can have five cars in his garage? Sure. Do they make sense for the guy who makes $70,000 a year and needs one car and doesn't have the ability to replace a $30,000 battery five years down the road? Absolutely not. So that all becomes clear this year, right? Tesla's earnings are not going to grow this year. Yet they're trading at 60 times their 2024 PE at, uh, earnings estimate. That means the street is telling you Tesla is going to pay you as a dividend 100% of its 2024 net income for 60 years, right? That's what a 60 times multiple says. So they need to significantly grow their earnings for that multiple to be justified, and their earnings are going to decline. So when you add all this up, mix it up, and you put a price target out there, we believe this company is gonna be $23.53 exiting this year uh, because we believe reality is gonna set in on the ridiculous analysis that's being done in this space. And I believe as that reality begins to set in, a lot of the, what we believe, this is our opinion, crimes that Elon Musk has committed also will come to the forefront and maybe US regulators will wake up and stop eating pizza and, and do their jobs and come in and look at some of these things he's done. But that's not even in our analysis. We assume Tesla is above all laws. Our analysis is based purely on fundamentals. And on those fundamentals, Tesla is worth $23.53. If these lawsuits start to come into play, that number is probably much lower. But that's our official price target. And I think that's why Tesla is the best short in the stock market right now. Because the viewpoint on Tesla is still, it's more than an auto company. They're going to grow substantially. And those two theories are going to be thoroughly debunked um, as we as they report earnings every single quarter this year. And I think it will be reflected in the stock price. Gordon, you know what I love about you that you do so well that, you know, I think, um, you know, all the best investors that I've been around and I certainly try to emulate myself, which is use data to create narratives and then use data to predict when the narrative is going to change. It's not about having right. quote unquote, the best data or quote unquote, being the smartest guy in the room. It's about understanding that investing is a social activity. It's a behavioral activity. 
And we investors like us were obviously using data to front run those changes in the mood of society about a particular factor, about broader asset markets, uh, et cetera. So excellent pitch, my friend. Uh, you mentioned you had a second stock for us. Yeah, let me make this quick. But think- this one is just as exciting. This was just as exciting. So so we have a we have a so I told you I like to do supply demand models. We have a solar supply demand model. Yeah. You know, so 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 demand is we do it by country, right? We have about 50 countries we track, we update it daily. This is why I don't get much sleep, stuff like this. <laughs> um, you know, our, our clients don't appreciate it. They just see, you know, Germany, France, they, they don't realize I'm having to check these websites every day, you know. It, but here's the point. The point is this. So in that supply demand model. We look at demand by country, then we look at supply. So there's different different, different um, uh, form factors, if you will. So the way the solar works is you take sand, you put it into a very high heat melter, you melt it into what you call polysilicon, right? So that's one factor in solar, polysilicon, right? So then you take that polysilicon, you stamp it, you cut it into wafers, that's another factor, wafers. Then out of those wafers, you cut cells, that's another factor, and then those cells, you use a number of cells to make the modules. So you have polysilicon, solar polysilicon, solar wafer, solar cell, solar module, right? So we track hundreds of vendors in each of those different areas, right? Here, here's my point, Darius. This, this is actually quite easy. There's hundreds of global uh, um, cell manufacturers, right? People who make solar cells, right? Talk about Jinko Solar, Trina Solar, um, uh, Longi, uh, uh, Canadian Solar, et cetera. There's hundreds of those guys globally right seven vendors seven seven vendors have enough capacity to supply the entire world right so solar modules are a commodity product right it's a commodity so if there's seven guys that can supply the entire world and there's over a hundred guys total making this stuff what does that mean prices are going to do right you're going to have a price war of all price wars which is currently unfolding, right? So against that backdrop, China is 51% of global solar demand, right? The country of China alone. Wow. So what's happening in China? Their grid has installed so much solar, it's becoming overburdened and they're now pushing back. So if you look at any sell side analysts model, it's like, including ours, by the way, well, not until recently, it's like, 2023, China installed, I don't know, what was it, like 30 gigawatts, right? And then every year it grows 15%, right? That's how sell side model looks. Every year, 15%. Yeah. This year, that number is probably going to be zero, right? Mm-hmm. So if you take your China growth estimate, so you're, you're already looking at massive oversupply on the supply side, right? So you're already looking at a price war. Where I think the street is going to be shocked is going to be the flatness and growth in solar installations in china and this isn't darius this isn't rocket science just go to google type in china solar capacity constraints and a a number of articles will pull up proving what i'm telling you nonetheless you know people are modeling this growth in china so not only are you going to have a price war but the price war is going to be much more pronounced than people are expecting because of limitations in china so what is like we were discussing with the macro what china is going to do then is there those 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 cell manufacturers and module makers instead of selling that stuff in china they're just going to dump it into the rest of the world causing a price war right so i think that the earnings for these solar companies are going to be much worse i can't stress that enough much worse than what people expect uh Enphase reported numbers recently they're 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 an inverter manufacturer now clearly they, that's not a module but they're all interconnected right when you put a system on your roof you need a module, you need an inverter, you need racking, mounting, all that stuff. Their numbers were horrific. They missed Q1, guided Q2 to effectively a loss, and the stock is up like 40% since they reported earnings because they said, don't worry, our guidance is horrible, but in 2Q, things are going to get much better. They said the same thing, by the way, 30 days ago and 60 days ago. They were wrong. They're going to be wrong again. Mm-hmm. I think solar earnings season is going to be horrible. I think the numbers are going to disappoint across the board. And I think the earnings power of these solar companies is structurally lower because you have weakness and in, in grid capacity constraints in China. In the U.S., you have this thing called NEM 3.0, which basically California got rid of a massive incentive for solar. When you take away the incentives, the installations literally stop. Like, so this idea that solar is you know, more effective than fossil fuel, that, that's the biggest lie that's ever told. 
You take away the free taxpayer money, no solar gets installed. So you have a massive oversupply. The reason why you have that oversupply, by the way, Darius, is because in 2020 to 2022, with Fed putting all this money into their market, if you said, I'm a solar company, right, you got free money. Like, so all, what all these companies did is they took half of that and funneled it through to, you know, the, 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 C, the C level executives in China. But the other half, they used to actually build capacity. So you have all this irrational capacity expansion, which is now culminate, culminating in a massive oversupply, which is resonating in a price war in a year when the biggest driver of demand is about to see a big collapse in their growth. I think this is a structural short. These stocks are extremely volatile. Sunrun was down 10% yesterday. It's up 10% today. You have to be willing to stomach big moves. But Darius, take a look at the solar tan index, our biggest call last year. Amazing short in a raging bull market. You want to be short these stocks in our view. And I can pitch along if you want. Great call. So you have a ticker you like the most or a tan is just the uh, short tan just to, to capture the entire play? No, 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 no. We, we, we like specific stocks. So uh, we would be short Jinko Solar on the module side, on the polysilicon side. A lot of, a lot of the bone has been taken off. To, a lot of the meat has come off that bone. We, 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 we initiated Daku when it was, I think, around 60 bucks. Uh, and now I think it's, you know, I think with a $30 target and people said, oh, it can't go to 30 because they have $40 in cash. The cash is fake. You, anybody who knows Chinese companies and, and we have specifics around that, but people said it couldn't go to 40. It's in the teens now. Um, so but it's, it's going lower. So Daku on the polysilicon side, Sunrun and Sonova, we believe are uh, tax frauds. Um, that's our opinion. Uh, so we like those on the res side. Um, and we also like Canadian solar on the short side. Um, and on the on the inverter side, we like Sedge as a short solar edge. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. Uh, so tickers for, for those who may not be uh, new to this space. Tickers. What's that? I'm sorry. What are, what are oh, the yeah. tickers? So, uh, Jinko, JKS, Canadian solar, CSIQ, yeah. uh, solar edge, SEDG, yep. SEDG, yep. Sedge. Um, uh, what other ones did we say? Um, Daku DQ. Yep. Um, and was that it? Uh, Sunrun Run, um, the Niggers Run. So th those those would be the ones we focus on. This is awesome, man! Another masterclass. I love when you come on, man. This is uh this is great. Get to get that get our get our feet our fingers dirty in terms of all the uh, all the micro uh, dynamics. And you know, quite frankly, I, I agree with you on a lot of what you're saying about China. Just in terms of you know, it seems that capacity, whether it be overcapacity in the real estate market, overcapacity in the manufacturing sector. It's just very obvious that they are headed for an elongated period of deflation. That's the only way you can read right. excess capacity, right? You need to have the returns in these sectors uh, uh, be, be be low enough for a long enough period of time so that and people, you know, the, uh, the investors stop investing in it, right? Obviously, the, a lot of investment that goes on in the Chinese mainland economy is state driven. So they're probably in order to keep people employed and shovels in the ground, they're likely to continue adding capacity. I mean, this is an economy that's still growing five, <laughs> allegedly 5% on a real basis. Now we can argue. Allegedly, whether, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we can argue whether or not it's 5%. Certainly the world is not really feeling that uh, 5% when you look at global export growth, et cetera, et cetera. But certainly it's an economy that's still probably growing a little bit too fast relative to uh, the disinflationary and, and really outright deflationary outlook that we continue to see uh, in terms of their credit uh, dynamics. So uh, we'll wrap it up there, man. But as always, uh, I, I, I leave the last question, uh, my favorite question I ask all the guests. Uh, you've certainly had, heard me ask this before. Maybe you have a different answer this time, maybe not. Uh, but what's one risk management lesson uh, that you live by today that you wish you knew at the start of your career? Yeah, focus on liquidity above all else. In, 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 this, in, this, in this Fed environment, and liquidity, Darius, you, again, you know this better than me, Fed balance sheet minus TGA minus RRP. Focus on what that's doing and where it's going. If you can predict that, and I do believe it's going, it's going to you know, melt higher through the end of March. I think you can predict with a great degree of certainty or with, with, a, with, a, with a confidence uh, what stocks are going to do. So I think macro is very important right now. Darius, you know this probably better than me. You know, a lot of hedge fund guys, you say macro and they're like, who cares about macro? You say technical and nobody cares. But you got to follow that stuff in the market because this is a factors market. It's not, 100%. you know, it's not a fundamentally driven market for the most part. So I would say, I wish, I wish I would have focused more on liquidity. I am doing that now. Uh, I think that's very important.
Absolutely, man. Could have said it better myself on the factor stuff, man. The the, the, the growth of passive, obviously overtaking active well, in terms of um, assets under management has turned this into a factors market. People put on factor bets more so than they put on individual uh, bets on, on, on individual stocks or even individual uh, sectors. So all of our research at 42 Macro is designed to help investors, you know, pick factors and understand rotating in and out of factors based on our market regime analysis and, and, and so on and so forth. So uh, definitely. Right. But what will kill that? Yeah. What will kill that? And we're not there yet. But I think inflation is about to revert significantly higher because, again, the, the factors that drove it initially, you know, loose financial conditions, all time high stocks um, and, and a Fed that's not consistent. Those are now happening right now. Um, so if for inflation reverts significantly higher, even though the Fed, and in my view, the Fed's mandate is right now to get President Biden reelected, they're going to have to fight inflation, right? That's why they were created. So when they're forced to fight inflation, they can no longer backstop the U.S. stock market. Um, I think factors will be less important and we'll shift back to fundamentals being important. But for now, it's a factors market. 100 percent, my friend. Well, we'll wrap it up there, everyone. Appreciate everyone for joining us. Uh, thanks, as always, uh, for joining us for Pro to Pro Live. We got our friend Dylan LeClaire joining us uh, next month uh, ahead of the uh, Bitcoin halving. So that's going to be a fun uh, discussion. So uh, we'll catch you back here, everyone. Be, uh, be well in the interim. Cheers.